our career service lightning talks. Um, I'm Allison Benner. I'm the Associate Director of Career Services, and I'm here with all the members of our, of our team that are here to support you on your own uh, career journeys. Um, before we get uh, going, I do want to acknowledge um, that the University of Victoria uh, stands on the traditional territory of the Lekwungen people. That's the Songhees and Esquimalt First Nations, and also to acknowledge the Husainich peoples whose uh, historical relationships to this land continue to this day. I myself have been a very grateful guest on this these lands for 35 years and hope to be here for some time to come. Um, before we get going, just um, a few little things about this session. Uh, as you probably saw at the beginning, this, uh, this meeting is being recorded. Um, also, we have this plan for one hour and 15 minutes. There are several presentations and there will be time at the very end uh, for questions that you might have. If a question occurs to you as you're uh, listening to the presentation, please feel free to put your question in the chat and we will save all those questions for the end. Um, but uh, right now, just to get going, if you wanted to um, put your your name or what year you're in, uh, what your major is, just to kind of get a sense of who's in the room with us, um, that would also be lovely. So you can see our agenda here. We have the five talks and the Q&A. And with no further ado, I am going to introduce Kare White, who's our career educator for engineering and computer science, who's going to speak to us on preparing for the future of work, skills to thrive in a changing uh, job market. So strap in and I hope you enjoy our talks. Thanks again for coming. Hello, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, Allison, for introducing me. I'm Kare. Um, if I could start with my first slide, please. So I want to give you guys the landscape of the land, so to speak, the job market of land, um, where we're going um, and and why things are tumbling that way. Um, so on my little chart, there's some economic drivers, big picture, daily reality. So that's the column on the left-hand side. Going across, you'll see the things that are driving our economy are the climate crisis, a shortage of workers, and machine learning. And so all of those will have these rollout effects that will create a big picture for us, sort of the economy, things that will be happening, and then daily reality, what things will look like. So in terms of our climate crisis, we have chosen to drive for net zero. So um, we want to try and capture all of our carbon emissions um, and that will affect potentially every kind of work. Um, how are we going to capture carbon and then not produce it? And then from there, what that creates is what we call a green economy where there will be lots of job losses and job gains. Um, and in particular, what comes out of that is a word you're going to hear a lot of is skill gaps. Well, we um, have people to work, but then they don't have the right skills to do the job because they don't understand this new technology that we need to capture the carbon, for example. Um, so keeping that like on your radar um, will just help you be more lined up when you see those changes happening. You'll go, oh, that's what she was talking about. We also have a shortage of workers, which is gonna drive quite a few things. So basically we're talking demographics, the baby boomers, post-war, everybody came home from the war. Those who came home from the war went, woohoo, let's make babies. And we have this massive uh, population surge. Those people are now uh, retiring. And so demographically, the chart goes down like this because we have less and less people born each year. Um, so we will really actually run out of workers. I don't know if you guys have noticed things like in the summertime, sometimes um, like I've seen a retail location be closed due to lack of workers. Um, that will also drive employers to use artificial intelligence and different software tools to get the work done that they don't have the people to do. Provincially, our province, I'm pretty sure this is going to happen nationwide, but our BC government has said that 80% of the jobs that will exist futuristically will need a minimum of six months of post-secondary training for all of us. So that's all digital skills. So if you're interested in getting a jump on that, the Future Skills Grant um, is uh, the government um, ponying up to help you come up with funds to get some of that digital training. You can find it at the continuing studies departments of universities and colleges across the province. 
The other thing that's going to happen is we have a pool of workers. So we call that diversity, equity, and inclusion. That pool of workers that we're not necessarily tapping into, um, we're really going to need to. We're going to need to figure out how to include those people in the workforce. Um, and it, as well, um, the aging, the old folks. Um, so for the first time, we'll probably have five plus generations on a team at work. And so um, it'll it'll make for interesting times and interesting projects for sure. Um, the other thing that's happening, as I'm sure you're aware, is machine learning. Um, so that part of artificial um, intelligence that is not just like do a Google search, but is actually thinking for itself. So it's generating new information. It goes at such a rapid pace that it's a little bit mind blowing um, to try and keep up with it. Um, and it will also drive a transitioning economy and therefore the skill sets that we need to do our work. And so likely what will roll out of that are these new ways of learning or micro credentials is a common term for that. So we maybe don't all have to go back and get another degree, um, but we'll go do quick hits to learn how to maybe use the software tool or how to become project managers or change managers, different things like that. Um, take uh, those opportunities whenever they come your way. All of that combined is what's changing to make our future really more dynamic and different since uh, like the onset of the Industrial Revolution. This is called the fourth Industrial Revolution and it's it's touted to be the biggest set of changes. So I don't know about you guys, but I'd like to be at least a little bit ahead of the curve on, uh, as opposed to behind it. So to help you do that, I'm going to get my next slide. There we go. Awesome. There are opportunities, but there will also be challenges. So trying to keep that in your mindset. Basically, simplistically, repetitive tasks will be replaced by AI tools. So um, I have that picture up there to tell the story of a company that creates the dashboards, the computerized dashboards for ships. They're one of the largest companies in the world that does this. I happened to be trapped in a ferry lineup talking with the VP of the company. They had 75 HR people. They added a software and reduced their HR staff to 25 because the software could do inexpensively without any errors what all of those people were previously doing. So in that um, industry field, um, certification, safety certifications are top. And uh, it was something that instead of having people track to make sure the workers were getting them, the software could do instead. So back to my list, repetitive tasks will be replaced by AI tools because of efficiency, lack of workers and decarbonization. So again, those driving forces. So what we will need to do is really increase our people skills. What are our soft skills looking like? Don't, it's okay, Darcy. Um, so top, 10 fastest growing jobs will be AI machine learning specialists, not a surprise, right? Um, sustainability specialists. So how are we going to take care of our earth? How are we going to um, also have good mental health, good governance, those kinds of things? Business intelligence. Um, that's probably my favorite, favorite job right now for um, new university students is, or, or university graduates is to go between the tech and the people and try and talk both of those languages to create a product that, that works on both sides. Um, fintech engineers might be a term you haven't heard recently or at all. Uh, fintech is financial technology. Um, so traditional banking systems are being replaced by a variety of different tools to try and make um, business startups easier. Um, data analytics, data analytics, data analytics, which in some ways is really nice that we're actually taking data. The other one that I want to point out is agricultural equipment operators. Um, it will be huge. We, in, in terms of decarbonization, we need to figure out how we're going to get food into our inner cities and not like drive a truck to get the food there, which is producing carbon. Um, the other day I heard about a uh, work to grow a blueberry bush that the equipment could remove the blueberries from because there's no workers to remove the blueberries with uh, with da less damage to the, the bush. So it won't just be equipment operators. I think we'll see lots of changes in agriculture. Um, information's from 2023 World Economic Forum. 
And then the top 10 um, fastest declining jobs. Again, think repetition. If somebody uh, does the same task every single day, there is potential for some um, of that to be replaced by a software or an AI, like a generative AI. Um, some people will be using those things to make their money or make their work go faster. Um, to, to help you understand that, that all of us will be touched by this, University of Toronto uh, law professor had all of his um, students one year upload all of the case law. And normally what would happen for a big lawyer's office is they would have like eight or 10 juniors. They would go and do all the research to figure out which case law is similar so they can make their arguments. But now they just put in a few keywords into a database and boom. So who's where are all those entry level lawyers going? Um, just because you're smart doesn't mean there's a job there for you. So looking at different skills that will be valued. What's next? So five occupations that will feel the impact of AI within North America. So this is from Indeed. Accounting professionals, it's repetitive. Marketing, advertising, repetitive. Software, healthcare, and insurance. So um, it's changing the way people work, but it's not going to replace them. We will still have to make decisions and be the overseers. Darcy? So top skills on the rise. Creative thinking. Uh, that's going to be monumental. So is analytical or critical thinking. So the thing that the AI produced, the piece of information or the product, is it going to actually be any good? Is it actually going to do the work? Um, it reminds me a little bit about um, trying to solve the homelessness problem. And what people need to do is drill down and actually talk to the people who are on the streets. And you find out that a third of them have mental health issues. So it's not just about getting a physical place for them to stay. It's also about health. Um, access to food, different kinds of things like that. Um, again, the information from the World Economic Forum, and they're saying 50% of us will need reskilling by 2025. Next slide, please. So understand what your transferable skills are. What are you good at doing? What people skills, what soft skills? And then really work on articulating your value. So you can describe in your cover letter, in your resumes, in your interviewing, how you can help that company work with those tools. Look for and spend time on foundational skills and learn the rest as you go. That our resilience will be faking it till we make it. Networking, again, that kind of a people skill, talk to people, try and maintain some kind of relationships, make them authentic as much as possible, but just pulling up in a corner won't, won't work. And then in case I haven't said it 10 times already, build human soft skills, but do it through your experiences. And so I can't recommend enough co-op programs. It's one of the reasons I came to work at UVic is because they have such a strong co-op program. It's how you will build all of this stuff. And I think that's all of my slides. There we go. So I get to introduce Samantha Ogrodnik. She's gonna talk about soft skills, the secret ingredient to career success. Go Sam. <laughs> Thanks, Kare. Um, So yeah, I'm talking about soft skills. So really building off of the information that Kare just presented to you. Um, and next slide, please. So when you think about success, what do you think makes someone successful in their career? Is it technical skills? Could it possibly be your work experience? Is that going to make you successful in your career? Or is it simply your education? Well, we're going to talk about all of those things in the next few minutes. So while these, all of those skills are important, or sorry, all of those aspects are important, uh, there's another critical factor that often gets overlooked, and those are soft skills. <laughs> Thank you. Though, and so your soft skills are the secret ingredients to your career, career success. Some of you may be thinking, okay, well, what are soft skills? I know I've heard about them before. So Soft skills include personal attributes, sometimes their personality traits, and their interpersonal abilities. 
And because these are skills, um, these are things that can be learned. Some people may be thinking, oh, well, you have to be born because it's part of my personality. I have to be born knowing these things. Well, you can actually learn and improve all of these things. So you can improve your empathy. You can improve your critical thinking skills. You can improve your creativity. It's just what you focus on in life. So when we're considering soft skills, we have to also have to think of hard skills because you're going to be learning both. Um, hard skills are the considered the technical skills required for your job. They can be things like lab skills that you learn in your science courses, computer skills, everything you learn to do on a computer. Using field equipment, uh, maybe you're doing some field studies or you're learning how to use tools and machinery data analysis. So these are hard skills that you're learning as a result of your probably academic or um, work experiences. But if you're wondering as well, like, well, how can I improve my soft skills or what are my soft skills? You're actually learning them right now as you, as you do your courses um, because UVic has what's called the core competencies. There are 10 of them. And as you can see, um, there are a few of them that are also that were mentioned in um, a few previous slides, uh, like communication, teamwork, social responsibility, professional behavior. Those are all things that you will learn. And OK, so soft skills are important, but why do they matter? Well, I'm going to talk about uh, a few things. So one of them is job market trends. Uh, today's employers uh, really are emphasizing soft skills, as Karay talked about, uh, more than ever before. And if we're wondering what will be the hallmark of um, successful professionals moving forward, uh, Karay talked about that, that, you know, we're coming into a digital era with AI and machine learning coming forward, coming into, um, into our lives. Well, uh, I think Kare also mentioned some information, some data from the World Economic Forum. And, and they, in the, this report, uh, they mentioned that in the future, the job market will demand a new breed of workers, those who can seamlessly blend technical expertise with, as we said, those critical soft skills, such as creativity, emotional intelligence, and strategic thinking. That's how you're going to be a successful professional moving forward. And so why do soft skills matter? Again, the second thing, uh, in, in addition to job market trends, there is lifelong relevance to these skills. Unlike technical skills that can become outdated, soft skills are timeless. Um, they are essential across ind all industries and all roles. You can be an artist, you can be a business owner, a nurse, a doctor, a teacher, a scientist, a dancer. You can be doing customer service work, you can be a CEO. In any of these areas, um, you will need to really have great soft skills in order to um, keep going on your career. How do soft skills set you apart in the job market? Well, they can considerably give you a very competitive edge uh, because many applicants could share the same kind of technical qualifications, like maybe you and uh, somebody you're competing against, you exactly have the, the same coding skills. Um, there's an example here that we can think about. There could be two software engineers that have similar coding expertise, which is a technical or hard skill, but it's really very possible that someone with the better communication and teamwork skills could advance. People really need connection and we need to remember how people treat us. We always remember how people treat us and make us feel. So that human connection and those soft skills are extremely important. Um, and also when you're considering um, job interviews. So this uh, illustration or this diagram uh, was taken from um, an article in Nature magazine. More than 1,100 research leaders from 77 countries told Nature about where and how they recruit scientists and who makes the cut. So one of the questions that was asked of these employers was if you have two candidates who demonstrated similar levels of technical ability or experience, what factors would help you make the final decision? Uh, it turned out to be communication skills. So don't be shy about showcasing your soft skills in interviews because they could be the 
excuse me, they could be the deciding factor in uh, who gets hired. Another way that soft skills can set you apart in the job market is with through leadership potential. Most leadership roles require excellent soft skills. For another example situation could be if there are two employees and they're both up for a promotion, uh, they both could have similar technical experience again. But if there's one of the employees that consistently has is responsible for leading effective meetings, resolving team problems, guiding projects really smoothly, it's, it's much more likely that that person with those great soft skills will get the promotion. And now if you're wondering, okay, well, if soft skills, if those are things that can be learned, how do I develop them? Well, there's lots of ways. Uh, you can join uh, clubs or groups. You can volunteer. Uh, there's many student organizations on campus where you can join and, you know, maybe ask to um, lead a meeting. Uh, you can ask for feedback. You can ask friends, peers, supervisors. You can even consult us at Career Services. We can do mock interviews with you and we can give you feedback on how you answer questions for a job interview. That's how you can um, develop some of your soft skills. More ways are, as Corey mentioned, you can do a co-op work term or even having part-time jobs during your school doing group projects, all of these experiences give you all of those uh, great collaboration, teamwork and problem solving skills. And uh, also networking is extremely important. Th while you're a student, you have the opportunity to join um, for free or at a reduced cost professional associations, become a member and you can um, attend all their events um, and uh, webinars and free conferences usually. There are other ways of improving your soft skills too. The uh, LinkedIn Learning is a free um, as a free resource thanks to the public library. If once you go onto your public library account, you can access LinkedIn Learning. And I had a look the other day, and um, on the next slide, I'll show you. There you go. So there is actually a professional soft skills learning pathway that's already. Uh, built into the LinkedIn learning platform. And it has, um, it looks like if you wanted to take the the complete pathway, it's nine hours of content. And it's all free um, of helping you learn things like developing your emotional intelligence, building resilience, which is something we all, we all are working on since COVID, it seems, and embracing change, especially unexpected change. There are other ways as well. There are other online platforms such as Coursera. There is edX as well and Udemy. Sometimes um, if you do want the certificate of uh, like proving that you did the program, you can pay for the certificate. Sometimes it's $60, but you can also take the courses for free. And finally, um, if you did want to pay a little bit more, you can also take um, a essential soft skills training with continuing studies at UVic. And so uh, in summary, as we mentioned uh, already, many technical tasks may be automated. There's lots of talk about AI, machine learning, all of that stuff coming forward. But don't forget that your soft skills um, are really, really valuable and they remain um, uniquely human aspects of you and what makes you unique and special in the world. And thank you. Um, I'm gonna pass it on to Selena next. Hi everyone, thanks Sam. Um, so there's no real such thing as like the perfect resume, but there are definitely best practices. So today we're gonna talk about like the top 10 pet peeves of employers and recruiters when they are reading yours. Next slide, please. Yeah, so number one, typos and grammatical errors. So careless mistakes can make a poor first impression. So make sure that you are, the common typos and grammatical errors that I see are things like use of tenses. So if it's happened in the past, keep it in the past. Uh, punctuation, so making sure that your commas and apostrophes are in the right places capitalization errors, see those quite a bit as well. 
uh, and spelling mistakes. And I have an eagle eye and I find these things. So <laughs> I would say run your doc through VMOC, which is our AI technology, which can pick up spelling errors and look at word redundancy. It has a whole bunch of great ways of giving you feedback instantaneously. So that's a great tool that you have access to as a student. I would say run it through Grammarly to make sure or some kind of um, complement like type of um, program like Grammarly uh, uh, and have others read your work. More eyes on it, the better. Number two, poor formatting, font that is too small. So ideally you're looking at 11 point to 12 point for readability. Um, no header. So your header is kind of important because that's where all your contact information is. So you want to make sure you have one and also putting it in the header spot. Different fonts used throughout the document. So that just shows like an inconsistency and it confuses readers. So I would stick with one font um, and you can use italics and bold to like kind of emphasize or de um, uh, structure it that way. Um, dates that aren't aligned. Um, generally, we like to write a line. Otherwise, if everything's aligned to the left, it kind of gives like a visual imbalance, which um, again, people, you want people to be interested in reading and if it looks neat and tidy they're more apt to do so too much text or long paragraphs without bullet points so large blocks of text can be overwhelming and they won't read it because if you're thinking about it people are looking at your resume for 30 seconds or less so you want to keep bullet point use bullet points um, instead of long paragraphs to get your point across and also your document being too long or too short. So ideally, we're looking at two pages for a resume, one page for a cover letter. That's best practices. If you're applying for an academic position, that can change a little bit. And that's a little bit of a different animal. But really, it's consistency is key. Unprofessional email addresses. So no kiss me quick at hotmail.com. Um, here you see a header um, example. The highlighted yellow areas are optional. So if you want to extend the length of your uh, resume without actually physically extending it past two pages, you can add in things like a LinkedIn customer URL, customized URL, or a professional website. This invites the reader to learn more about you. Ensure that your contact information is correct and current. Um, the highlighted areas in this example are optional. So these are the things that you can put in or not, up to you. Next slide, please. Incorrect information. So providing incorrect information can be both confusing and create kind of an immediate lack of trust between you and a, and a potential employer. Ensure that your document is correct and up to date with dates and date ranges, names of organizations, roles and positions, specific responsibilities and tasks, and contact information. And just remember that overstating qualifications can backfire, and you always want to provide honest and accurate information. Next slide. Number five, generic or vague objectives. So I kind of see objectives in general as a dying breed. Um, they generally say something like seeking a challenging position to grow my career, which does not necessarily give the employer information about your goals or the value that you can bring to that, to that employer. So I would say consider using a professional profile or a summary section instead of an objective. And this is what I call the hot sell too. It's right at the top of your resume. And this is where you can highlight those most important aspects from the job description or the type of work that you want to do to really catch that employer's attention. Next slide, please. Lack of keywords. Okay, so ATS stands for Applicant Tracking Systems. You may have heard of them. Large organizations often use them to vet resumes, and how they vet the resumes is often recognizing key buzzwords. That's one way that the system can read and vet your resume. And so one thing that happens is if you don't do it that way, and you can get kicked out of a job competition. If, the, if it's not ATS-friendly format, it can bump you. Um, so things to keep in mind, again, VMOC is the tool that we have for you to have access to that you can create, help you create an ATS friendly resume format. Next slide, please. Too duty oriented. So we're really moving away from a task list, clean floors, wash dishes to accomplishment statements. So how you did what you did. Um, you wanna really create um, specific, be specific when you're talking about your competencies and abilities 
And if you keep within like the context action result format in those bullet points, that can um, give the information that and expand on your value or your experience, sorry. Another way of looking at these, and this is an example of some bullet points, if you ask the questions, how much, how many, how often, that can often trigger the more specific details that you want to include in these bullet points. Next slide. Number eight, irrelevant information. So I think it's really important to always ask yourself, will this or does this add value to my application? Is this something the employer would value? Is this something I wanna share that I think is important? Um, you will try and avoid including avoid including personal information like marital status or social security number. Those are not needed in this process um, until you actually get hired. And then they might need your social insurance number. Um, highlight areas that show growth and development. So if you're adding an interest section rather than just listing all the things you like to do, try and use examples where there's a bit of a growth or trajectory, um, such as sports or learning a musical instrument. That's a little bit more. It shows that you kind of can start with something and learn and grow, um, and that's appealing to employers. Uh, no headshots or photographs in your docs. Again, that can mess with the ATS and also we generally don't do that in the Canadian format of the resume. And finally, avoid planting seeds of doubt. And I know my students will say I say this a lot, um, but you can plant seeds of doubt in your language. If you're using a passive tone, I see a lot of I believe that I can be just I am own it, right? Have a little assertiveness. Um, you're probably not going to want to say in your cover letter, um, I'm looking for a job for a year and I have two small children. You don't need to include that information and it plants a seed of doubt in the mind of the employer saying, oh, this person's going to leave after I put all this investment into training them and they're going to be sick all the time because they have two small children. It doesn't matter if it's true or not. That's the seed of doubt that you've planted by giving that information that really wasn't even asked for in the beginning. Next slide, please. Not aligning content to the job description. The golden rule of resumes is tailor and target. So you really want to spend some time deconstructing the job description um, and looking for what those skills are that are most valued by the employer. Um, often I think of it as comparing it to a kid's Christmas list. What do they put at the top of the list? They put the thing they want them most, right? Um, and then kind of midway down, it's like nice to have. And then at the bottom, you're kind of like, really? <laughs> <laughs> and it's kind of like that with a job description. So spend some time with it, get to know it and save a copy of it so that you don't submit and then forget what the job entailed when you get shortlisted for an interview. Include some keywords um, around that that you see in that job description, kind of mirror that language in your documents. Um, research the organization. One thing that I find people kind of miss um, if they look at a an organization, they'll go straight to the careers page, right? Like what jobs are they posting? What are they hiring for? But actually, if you go to the values page where they talk about their mission and they talk about company values, you can get a lot of juicy details around that. I use the example of BC Ferries often. Um, in that organization, if you look at their mission statement, it is people, 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 um, customer service and more people. So that informs me. That says, if I'm applying for to work at that company, if I'm interviewing with that company, I'm going to talk about my interpersonal skills quite a bit because that is something they value because they've said it right there. And again, revisit that job description when you've done your document, your resume and your cover letter, and go through each of those bullet points and make sure that you have like talked about those somewhere in your documents. That's a great way to check. Next slide. And number 10, not following submission instructions. Read the job carefully. <laughs> Things to watch out for. Um, most likely you're gonna submit in PDF format. If you want to see how ATS reads something, you can um, put your doc into plain text and you can see what the system would read. Um, ensure you're sending it to the correct place. So make sure you've got the right email <laughs> in there. Um, or you're in the right application system, um, have they asked for any additional documents? Sometimes they'll ask for a writing sample. If you're a writing student and you're submitting to a writing job and they haven't asked for a writing sample, that writing sample is your cover letter. Use good email etiquette. Just be polite, 
and professional at all times. And if you are applying for the provincial government, and here's a really good example of not following submission instructions, they have a very prescriptive way of applying, but they also have an amazing amount of resources and tools um, to help you be successful in that application process. So I would say ask around to people who already work for the government, talk about their experiences, what that was like for them applying, that can be useful. Um, go to the how-to resources that the government provides. So that's a perfect example of they have a very specific way of doing it. And if you don't follow those instructions, your application won't be seen. And that is the end of my presentation. So I'd like to um, pass the baton uh, to Carrie, our wonderful alumni career educator, who will talk about networking. Thanks, Selena. Um, my head is spinning. There is so much good information in this talk. I'm sure everybody is sort of having their head spin as well. Just a reminder that you're going to get these slides um, afterwards, but also we are your career educators, so feel free to come back to us and connect. This is what we're here for. Any of the stuff you want to review or practice, please reach out. Um, right, so um, I'm Carrie. I work specifically with our awesome uh, UVic alumni, and I see lots of names that I recognize. I'm really happy to have you here with us. Um, I'm going to talk today about networking. Specifically, I'm going to do more of an overview of in-person networking. Next slide, please. So what is networking? Um, networking is really just this idea of building connections and making relationships. I know this can be a really scary concept for some people, especially if you're like me, I'm a bit of an introvert, but what I really like is hearing people's stories and getting to know people. So you can come at this from lots of different angles, but mostly networking is really just kind of trying to connect with someone and build a relationship. Next slide. Why is networking important? It can help you to build valuable career connections. Um, it can open doors to future job opportunities. Um, it can also help you plan. So provide industry insights or industry trends, like Karay was talking about, um, all and and um, Sam as well, using our soft skills, um, what will be coming, what are the trends, things like that. Most of all, it helps us create a support system for our own career growth. And I think that's really important. Next slide, please. So specifically, how can networking help you? It can help you hear about hidden job opportunities. I know people have probably heard this already, but they say as much as 80% of jobs are this hidden job market, which means they're not posted or advertised somewhere. So this is sort of your chance to connect and hear about those opportunities. It can also help you meet with a potential employer, maybe even before there's a job opportunity. So it's kind of a chance to make a good impression even before a job is available. It can also support you in doing research. So, this is your chance to find out maybe what a particular role is like or even a, an organization that you're interested in. It can help you identify barriers and opportunities, and it can help you practice. So networking can help you interact with professionals in a professional setting. Next slide. So how do we find people to connect with? We can do this online or we can also do it in person. So if we're talking about online, we're probably talking about in uh, LinkedIn, which Darcy is going to be speaking to specifically, um, and maybe another social media platform. It could happen if you're partici participating in a webinar or a course. And then I'm going to talk a little more about in-person in -person networking. So industry events and networking platforms, job fairs, things like that. Even before we get to all that, though, I really want everyone to think about and remember that you already have an existing network of people that you could be working with. So who are these people? 
They're the ones that you walk through your day and are connecting with. They could be your family and friends. They could be classmates or coworkers, um, social media friends or contacts. If you're in school, they're your professors. Um, they could be any part of your social group. Maybe you're in a running club or you take an art class. Um, they could be current or former employers and also any professional contacts that you are connecting with day to day. It could be your doctor, your dentist, your accountant. All those people make up our existing network. These are all people we can be connecting with. Next slide. So when we're talking about uh, attending an event or doing in-person networking, I want you to take some time to really think how you can prep ahead of time. So when you come in there, you're kind of putting your best foot forward and you feel confident and ready to do that. So number one, to prep, know what your goals are. Why are you coming into the event? Maybe it's just a practice and you think, okay, this is something that I feel nervous about and not comfortable. I'm going to try my best just to connect with three people and have a conversation, right? Or maybe you want to have some very specific information. So come into that with your own goals. Learn about the event ahead of time. What is the structure going to look like? Uh, maybe it's a workshop with an extra 30 minutes tacked on to allow for mingling and networking. So have an idea what that structure is like. Um, Ahead of time, go ahead and research what the organizations are that will be there and maybe even the individuals that are part of those organizations. Uh, practice your personal introduction. Sometimes this is called an elevator pitch, and I'm going to talk about that in a minute. Uh, if it's a job fair, think about whether you want to bring a resume with you. Uh, some of the job fairs now ask you to just apply online, but some people are still taking resumes in person. If they are, it's a perfect opportunity to have a connection with someone, put your resume in their hands, and talk a little bit. And lastly, of course, dress appropriately. Next one. Here are just some quick networking tips for in person. So if you're going up to someone that you want to meet, introduce yourself, shake hands if it's appropriate, speak clearly and confidently, be curious. This is this is a big one. Ask about ask about their experiences, right? Um, smile, make eye contact, be aware of your body language. Um, again, have your elevator pitch ready, and then think a little bit about your closure, right? Know when it's time to move on and politely thank them. Next one. Okay, so this is just the elevator pitch. Uh, these are things that things that you probably want to practice ahead of time. You could do it in a mirror. You could do it with your career educator, friend, family member, but be comfortable going over these things. So the introduction, so who you are, your name, maybe your role, your field if you're working or your field of study, your professional identity, say a little bit about that. Maybe your key either job experience or education experience. What are your key strengths? If you can highlight maybe one or two unique skills or achievements. Uh, what is your current goal? Why are you there? What do you want to achieve by attending? And then important, engage, right? always close with some kind of question to continue the conversation and sort of create that buy-in, right? Remember that you're trying to create a connection. Here's a quick example. You might say to someone when you go to meet them, hi, I'm Ileana, I'm nice to meet you. I just graduated from UVic with a degree in psychology and business. This gave me such a good understanding for what makes people tick and also how that shapes business decisions. I'm really excited to start my career in a role where I can help with strategy and engagement. Can I ask you, how did you get started in your career? Okay, so introduction, professional identity, a few key strengths, what your goal is, and always remember to engage, right? Show interest in that person. Next one. Here are a quick few sample questions. Sometimes people get nervous and they don't know what to ask. 
How did they enter into the field or profession? Maybe what are some typical entry points to that job or role? Those are good things to know, especially if you just graduated. What are skills or knowledge that are important to be part of, to be in that role? Maybe are there prospects in the area wherever you are? Um, and then are there educational training requirements? Maybe you can be doing some upskilling if you need to. Next one. Okay, so following up and maintaining connections, make sure that you keep the connection warm after you've met someone. Reach out occasionally if you can, maybe with industry news, maybe congratulating them on a new role. Use social media to engage as well. Um, you can like, you can comment, you can share someone's post or repost something that they've put up just to support them. And then remember, this is reciprocal, so offer to, offer to help them as well. Maybe you're sharing a pertinent article or creating a connection for them, connecting them with someone or giving them advice. Next one. Okay, final tips for networking success, especially in person. Be genuine. Remember that people respond to authenticity. Uh, be patient. Results will come over time, okay? Be prepared. Always have that elevator pitch ready so you're comfortable and have fun. Networking is about meeting people, so I hope that you practice and you learn to enjoy it. Thanks so much. I'm going to pass this on to Darcy, who's going to tell us more about LinkedIn. Okay, so thanks, Carrie. So hi, everyone. Yeah, so I'm going to talk just briefly about LinkedIn. Um, some of you may already be using LinkedIn. Some of you may be a little bit reluctant, but trust me, it's much easier probably than you think it might be. So um, just a brief info introduction. So really, what is LinkedIn? It is professional networking. And so a lot of you might be kind of wondering, do professionals in Canada you really use LinkedIn? The truth is, yes, they do. And so we like to call it kind of the Facebook for professionals, but really it's that chance to engage. But again, the focus being on professional communication. And so talking about your skills, many people, of course, use it for job search as well. But we're also going to talk today mostly using it for how to make connections and some specific ways, kind of why and how you want to use it. You can, of course, um, most popular between LinkedIn and Indeed, usually the top two places that people look for work. Um, I will mention as well that often it is a first stop for recruiters. And so it does help to have even the most basic LinkedIn profile because uh, recruiters will often be checking your LinkedIn profile. If you're curious on how to add that to your resume as um, Selena had mentioned, send me an email. There's a really quick and easy little video that I can show you. Um, you can also use LinkedIn for company research. And so researching company pages, their videos, like what are they posting? What are they doing? And so if you're preparing for a job interview or just researching the company, LinkedIn is a really good place to start. And of course, you can also use it to create a list of company contacts. So if you want to start exploring and finding out who's working at this company and starting to network, as Carrie mentioned, um, you can find the list of company contacts there. So we'll show you how to do that. Um, just networking in general. So like 875 million, that's a lot of people, right? Um, and making connections. We're also going to talk about how to use UVic alumni as a starting point for um, building your networking. Okay, so um, I'm, because this is pretty tiny, we're going to zoom in here a little bit. So in terms of creating the most basic profile, this is kind of like a student cheat sheet, if you will. And so don't please don't feel that you have to include all of the sections. But the more of these sections that you can include, the more uh, robust your profile will be. So things like a decent photo, you know, it doesn't have to be fancy. Just even use your phone to take a decent photo. Um, just wear a nice shirt, right? Um, things like a headline and your summary. These are two places where you can really personalize. So different than a resume where you sort of have a certain format as to how and where you describe yourself, your headline here can include things like, what are you passionate about? You know, like, what are some of the cool things that you want to go in the future? Because this, again, doesn't have to be just what you've done, but where you want to go. And so your summary can also include things like what motivates you, what you're skilled at, some of the things that you really like to do. And so all of that, you can build in your interests, your um, growing your plan for the future before you get to the experience section. And then of course in there, just like on a resume, you wanna talk about some of your accomplishments. 
The nice thing about LinkedIn is you can also include posts. You can also include um, links to some of the work that you've done. So this is something that's um, a real bonus to have as well. So if you are active on LinkedIn, you can also include places like organizations. So um, different clubs that you're part of or areas that you're interested in. Okay. And so then page two of our little cheat sheet. Oops, I'm sorry. What did I do? Yeah. Okay, so um, here in your education section, um, you can also, of course, list um, the education that you're doing, all your past education as well. Um, volunteer experience, causes that you're interested in. So this can really show who you are as a robust person as well. Um, so this can be really good to include. Things like skills and expertise. There's a difference, which I'll point out, the difference between you can get people to recommend you for specific skills. So you and, you know, friends, colleagues, you can recommend each other if there's specific skills that you want to be known for, because the more recommendations you get for specific skills, if employers are looking at, it's a way to kind of grow your expertise, because it's not just you saying you have this skill, you have other colleagues, um, people who can recommend you for specific skills, places to include honors and awards that you've won. If you've won any awards, like give yourself credit for those, right? They're all important. Please, this is not the place to be shy. Brag about some of the great things that you've done and awards that you've won. There's also a place for courses. Please don't list like, you know, um, course numbers and stuff because that won't mean anything to an employer. But you can also include some of the particularly important courses that you've taken. There's also, of course, room for projects as well. So projects that you've either done through your school, projects that you've done on your own, projects you might have done through volunteer work. This is, again, a great place to be building up some of the how you're demonstrating the skills that you've used, just like Selena talked about in the resume um, portion. And finally, last but not least, you can also get recommendations. So back a long time ago, people used to get what's called letters of reference. Recommendations are um, posts that you can put on your LinkedIn profile. So you can get people like past bosses or colleagues to recommend you. Just a short little blurb that you can put on your LinkedIn profile so it's accessible for everyone. And you can do the same for your um, colleagues and friends as well. Okay, so a quick uh, terms of a top sort of top 10 list for using LinkedIn, how to make the most of it. Many people I know are a bit concerned about um, just that whole social media. How do you keep yourself, you know, maintain security and privacy, right? Do know that you can manage your privacy and settings and you can also, so you can control how much of your profile you're allowing people to see. So you can limit to only like those on LinkedIn can see it. You can uh, limit so that they can only see the top portion without seeing the details of your experience. You have complete control over how you set that up. And so do have a little look at your privacy settings as well. Um, as we mentioned, you can customize and use your own unique URL to put at the top of your resume as well. Again, if you want to know how to do that, send me an email. And um, it's a very quick little video, super easy. Thinking about personal branding. And so this is also the chance, you know, sell yourself as a professional, right? Or a budding professional. This is where you can start to put on, you know, some of your projects. This is who, who and how you want to present yourself to the world. So we already talked about using a good headshot. Um, including things like top skills using keywords, just like Selena talked about in the resume portion as well. Reinforce, reinforce, reinforce through your LinkedIn profile. Asking for and giving recommendations. It's really, it's a great way both to network, to support um, others who are job searching and that you've worked with in the past, asking them in exchange and in return. So again, kind of that mutual exchange, that's the reality of networking. And if you're a little bit scared of getting started with LinkedIn, start with friends or colleagues or people that you know. Just start, you know, connecting in a professional way and just getting used to using the, the technology and reaching out. And then you'll start to get um, the people that you're connected with. Their posts will come up in your feed so that you're getting, you know, what they're doing, all that kind of stuff as well. Um, connecting with UVic alumni and university contacts as well. I'll briefly show you how to get started doing that. Using, of course, the jobs and people section of company pages, which I'll also show you. Things like joining groups and, of course, accessing the LinkedIn learning, like Samantha mentioned at the um, earlier on in our conversation. So um, just for the interest of time, we'll just quickly move through some of the, the ways to make the best use of if there's a company that you want to find out more about. Of course, check out their homepage, their about, um, some of their posts. 
So again, if you're getting ready, whether to network or to go on an interview, check out what they're posting, right? They'll be talking about what are some of the events they've done? What are big projects they're working on? Super simple way to start researching the company. The life page is really cool because if you're thinking about getting a, um, getting a job there, what the life page does is it talks about like, what's it like to be an employee at BC Transit? But then if you scroll a little bit further down, you'll also find some of their top recruiters. So there are people like begging, do you want to work here? Please connect with me and let's talk. So it's an easy, direct way to reach out to some of the recruiters. The people page as well is super helpful because if you want to start finding people who work at this company, you can tailor and filter. Like you can filter by what city they live in, what um, kind of what work they do, what they're skilled in, what they studied at. So all of that is possible when you're logged into their website and you can search and this will help generate people that you might want to reach out to. Okay, so the same thing with Ubic alum. I would really consider things starting there because of course, if they've been students at Uvic, chances are, you know, they know all about research. They know what it's like to be a student. They're more than happy to help a fellow student, right? So out of the 109,349 alumni, again, you can filter. So you can filter by where do they live? What did they study? What are they skilled at? You can search by um, what are they doing? Like, where do they work now? And so it's really a customizable um, and super easy, like within five, 10 seconds, you can narrow down a list of people who are who have studied what you have studied or who might be doing what you're doing, who are working at companies maybe you wanna to talk to. So fantastic resource, really encourage you to check out that page. The one thing I will mention, when you are reaching out, please don't just, you know, say, hey, can we connect? Put on, like, there's a space where you can add a note. You click the connect button, and then it will give you a choice, send without a note, or you click on a little button that says add a note. This gives you 200 letters. I always point because it's this much space. Um, you have 200 letters to do your little introduction, right? So just like Carrie mentioned, when you're introducing yourself, something like, you know, hi, my name's Darcy. I'm a third year psychology student researching careers, you know, see if this might be a fit for me, wondering if you're, if you'd like to connect, or you can be more direct and wondering if you have 10 or 15 minutes to chat with me. Okay, so it's building that now they'll be much more likely to respond to you because they know why you're reaching out. And again, you're not asking them for a job, you're just asking to connect or asking for information. So some top tips you wanna remember in making the connections, do take the time to create that personalized message Mention your connection to that person. So like, you know, say if you met them at a hiring fair, like, hey, it was great to meet you at the hiring fair, just following up to stay in touch, something like that. Provide that brief introduction of who you are and why you want to connect, because again, it will help them understand that you're not looking for a job and you're not just some random person. You have a purpose, right? I'm a student. I'd love to chat with you about your career. Asking for general career advice or information about their company or the industry. So again, it's all just information. You know, what's your company like? How do people get hired? You know, um, do you enjoy working there? All those kinds of insider information. Because right now you're not asking, do you have a job for me? Unless, of course, if you're talking to the HR recruiter people, that's different, right? But if it's just talking to people who work there and getting a sense of, um, you know, what it's like to work there, Again, emphasis on information. And of course, do politely thank the people for considering your request. So just similar to like where Carrie talked about that um, elevator pitch, a more customized and sort of shorter to fit within that 200 word limit. Simple example, hi, my name's Darcy. I'm completing my psychology degree at UBIT. Researching organizations in the field of psychology would love to learn more about your company and you know the um, counseling industry here in Victoria. So again, you could either ask, just would like to connect with you. And then if they agree, you follow up with the request for the um, meeting, or you can add right in your first introduction. Would you be willing to meet, meet with me for 15 or 20 minutes just to, you know, give me some advice on my career? Okay, so that said, I will turn it over to our um, lovely careers assistant, Ilsa, who will wrap things up for us. Thanks, Darcy, and thanks, everyone. Um, really great information there. 
Uh, so yeah, we just want to encourage you to use us as a resource. Um, we're your career services team and we're here to support you. Um, so yeah, you see some information on the screen here. Um, you can book an appointment online with a career educator on the co-op and career portal, which is learning in motion. Um, and you can also check out our drop-in at the library every Monday and Friday afternoon. And uh, check out our website as well. And also, if you uh, have any questions, you can feel free to email us. Uh, my email address is careers at uvic.ca. So uh, feel free to send me an email and I'll point you in the right direction. Um, yeah, so and most of you, I believe, are already taking our uh, Your Career Starts Here course on Brightspace. But if you're not, I really want to point you to that as a great resource. Um, feel free to email me at careers at uvic.ca if you want information about that. That's for current UVic students only, unfortunately not for alumni right now. Uh, yeah, so I'm going to stop the recording here and we're going to get to some questions.